Lord, we ask that you'd move among us by your spirit, open our hearts and minds to hear, receive, and practice your word. We ask for Christ's sake. Amen. Welcome, friends. Our scripture reading this evening is taken from Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 20, which can be found on page 1061 of the Pew Bible. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 20 on page 1061. Listen to the word of the Lord. My point is this. Heirs as long as they are minors, are no better than slaves, though they are owners of all the property. But they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the Father. So with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, also an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to beings that by nature are not God's. Now, however, that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and beggarly elemental spirits? How can you want to be enslaved to them again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid that my work for you may have been wasted. Friends, I beg you, become as I am. For I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. You know that it was because of a physical infirmity that I first announced the gospel to you. Though my condition put you to the test, you did not scorn or despise me, but welcomed me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What has become of the goodwill you felt? For I testify that had it been possible, you would have torn your eyes out and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to exclude you so that you may make much of them. It is good to be made much of for a good purpose at all times and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I am again in the pain of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I were present with you now and could change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. This is the word of the Lord. What image is conjured up in your mind when you hear the word family. When you think of family, what do you think of? I'm sure for many of us, it leads us to think of warm things, wonderful times, people that we miss. But it's not that way for everybody. This came home to me one day when I was watching a football game with a friend of mine and a commercial came on about a restaurant, I can't remember which one it was, but the idea and the statement was, you know, if you come to our restaurant, please come, and if you do, we will treat you like family. And my friend muttered, if you're going to treat me like that, I'm not coming. I want to be treated better than that. I don't want to be treated like a family member. I'd rather be treated like a guest. And, of course, that was an interesting comment, and we talked about it for a little bit, and he told some pretty horrific stories, that when you were in the family, you had to conform to all these standards and rules, and there was difficult circumstances if you didn't. 
So there's different traditions, there's different ideas about what it means to be a family. And Paul, in this letter to the Galatians, and in this passage particularly, is getting at this question, what does it mean to be part of the family of God? And in the big picture, here's the story that we've been telling over the summer. It's clear Paul has preached the gospel to the Galatians in the past. And he tells some of that story in the latter part of this text, how he came to them. And there was some kind of physical infirmity that caused them to receive him with graciousness. But he preached a message, a gospel of freedom, of welcome, of being received as you are in Christ. And then he left. And we know from earlier in the letter that other folks have come along saying, yes, this story is great, but you've got to continue to keep the law. They said, who's this Paul? What does he know? And we've talked about that over the course of the summer, the different ways of thinking about what it means to be part of the family of God. And because of the persuasiveness of their arguments, some of those who had received Paul so completely such that he says they would have been willing to pluck out their eyes and give them to him if he had required them, they have, some of them have turned against him and begun to think that maybe he's more of an enemy. What's at stake in this discussion is what will the family of God be like? What does it mean to be part of the family of God? Paul has told a story and continues to tell a story of two groups of people. Two groups who will inherit the good news of what God has done in Jesus. Two categories who will have a joint inheritance. People from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different customs, different traditions, different ways of looking at the world. Who are these two groups of people? Well, for Paul, it's pretty simple. There's Jews and there's Gentiles. And we've talked about this before. From the Jewish perspective, uh, there were two groups of people in the world. There were those who were Jews and part of the family and the people of Abraham. And then there was everybody else. And it wasn't hard for them to think to be Jewish was to be good and part of God's family. To be Gentile was not to be good and not part of God's family. Paul's argument is that while Jews and Gentiles came from different places, from different perspectives, the Jews start with the law, the Gentiles did not. Paul says that that different starting place, that different context, ceases to matter with the coming of Jesus. If you can think of it like this, uh, it's like one person who has been faithfully attending church all of their lives and is steeped in the traditions and practices of the church. And another comes late in life, not knowing anything about all of that, with little understanding of the background. Paul would say, it doesn't matter. They're in Christ in the same place before God. Their respective journeys are very different. They may have been better or worse before they come to Christ as the world judges betterness or worseness. But in Christ, they're in the same place. Their respective journeys may be very different, but their end is the same. And their standing before God is exactly the same. Jesus, in his ministry in the Gospels, told parables about this. About people that had been working in the field all the day long, and others who came in right at the very end, and both got the same thing. Both received the same wage. And the ones who had been working in all day said, what's up with that? Well, God's doing a new thing. Paul's picking up on this. And it's interesting to think that earlier in the letter, Paul talks about the fact that he didn't get his gospel from the other apostles, but that he received it 
from Jesus himself, from the risen Lord. The end is the same. Adoption in the family of God. And what is that end? Paul says here in the text we've read that we are received as beloved children who can come before God just as we are and say, Abba, Father, that God will receive us, that we've been adopted into God's family just as we are. Welcome just as we are. That no one who may have been a part of it longer or do it in certain ways can say to us, boy, you, you don't do it the right way. You've got to change. You've got to rethink this or you don't fit. Paul says, no. The cross of Christ levels the ground. That we are received into God's family, adopted just as we are. Now, it's interesting, as Christianity has continued to spread, this same challenge has emerged. Right? Because what happens when you enter into a new family? You learn the traditions. You come just as you are, but over time, you start to, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, you do things in a certain way. And you can start to forget that time when you were new. When you were excited to be received just as you are, as somebody who didn't understand everything, but you were received. But over time, when you become a veteran, you think, well, you know, we do do things a certain way. And we start to think that those certain ways are the norms that everyone else has to conform to. Paul gets at that here when he talks about observing feast days and doing things in certain ways, certain months, days, etc. The Christian church had this very challenge as it moved forth into the world, keeping the mandate to take the gospel out to all the nations of the world, all the ethnicities, all people, to tell the good news. And over time started to say, oh, by the way, if you're really going to be part of this, you have to do things a certain way. We have certain feast days. We have certain liturgies. We have certain ways that we understand our ritual. You have to conform. It became a big challenge. Some who study the history of Christian mission look back on that and will say, unfortunately, for all the good that had been done and has been done, there is also a colonialism that seeped in. A sense of bringing traditions from other places and other times and imposing them on new converts. We've talked about that a bit over the summer. A leading missiologi a miss a missiologist has interpreted this portion of Galatians to come up with this principle, to mean this, the following, that no group of Christians are permitted to impose on another group of Christians any traditions, ideas, practices that come from their tradition but aren't part of the cultural traditions of the people with whom they're sharing the good news. He says you're not supposed to do that. Paul makes that clear in Galatians, because God welcomes people as they are. God welcomes people onto a journey. And that journey takes different forms. I would suggest that that's part of why we have the diversity in the church that we have in the world. Think of it like this. I have a friend who, uh, he and his wife, uh, it was, they had a vocation of adopting children. They adopted numerous children, had a big family of adopted children. And one of the things that they reflected on is what happened to their family every time they adopted a new child. 
They said, our family always changed significantly as we welcomed a new member into our midst. They tended to adopt older children, and their procedure wasn't to say, okay, you're part of our family now. You've got to conform to the way we do things. Yeah, well, there's some things that they did, but they also said, we are going to change. We want to know who you are, learn about who you are, and our family dynamic will change. They considered that part of what it meant to be welcoming, a giving, receiving, a sharing, learning together. That the dynamic, the community, the family is always changing as new members come into the midst. Paul's saying you don't take the posture that says, okay, we've got a set way of doing things, you've got to conform. That can start to look like a community that's very welcoming to everybody who wants to come in and be like them. We'll welcome you if you come and be like us. Paul says no. That's not how it is in the family of God. We welcome each other. We make room for each other, for each other. This is the goal of the letter. In Galatians 3.28, Paul's clear. It's the guiding principle of the letter that in Christ, we are one. And he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for all are one in Christ. We don't divide up the way the world does. There's unity in Christ. It's faith, not law or anything else that makes us one and calls forth unity. This language that Paul uses just before this text of being one in Christ. What does it mean to be one in Christ? Jesus prayed this in John chapter 17, and his prayer is that all those who believed would be one with each other the way he was one with the Father. Total unity, commitment to each other. It doesn't mean we're going to agree. It doesn't mean we won't have serious differences. But that's the goal. Unity with each other. So what does that mean? What does that mean for us? Well, here's the good news. Wherever you are in your life this evening, God receives you as you are. And as we confessed, we all have dark corners. Places that we might worry about, that we don't share with anybody, maybe even those who are closest to us, because we think if anybody knew that about me, I would be unlovable. I wouldn't have a place. I would be shunned. In Jesus Christ, you're welcome as you are. Friends, that's good news. The challenge that Paul's raising here in Galatians is those of us who have been so welcomed by God also need to so welcome everyone else who comes to God in faith. We welcome, we make room, we change. As God gave, Jesus gave himself up for us, those of us who were enemies, So we are called to do the same for others who may be our enemies, who may differ from us. Friends, we've talked about it in, over the summer, and as we enter into a very divisive period of time in our culture, politically, Culturally, how will we live out this call to receive 
those who are different from ourselves. Paul tells us that in Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God like children, welcome as we are to practice love in the midst of unity and difference. That's God's vision. And we are called to do the same thing, difficult though it may be. Tonight, as we receive the Lord's Supper, let's reflect on both the, the great joy that we have to come before God as we are and be welcomed, but also the responsibility that comes with that to welcome others as we have been welcomed. It's that way that God intends to heal the world in Jesus Christ. It's challenging. It's difficult. There are lots of folks, I have lots of friends on my Facebook page who say, that's impossible. It's too idealistic. You can't do that. Friends, it's just that kind of task that so many think to be impossible that God calls the church to practice. But the wisdom of God is that God sent his only son, God in the flesh, to die for us. What kind of sense does that make? Isn't that just giving up? Giving up power, control? That's the wisdom of God. And here's the challenge for us we are called to do the same thing, to be the body of Christ in the world who welcomes everyone just as they are. And as we welcome, we change. But in that way, we bear witness to something higher and better than what we see around us. the hope of peace for all people. Amen.